I'd now like the students to present their video to be followed by Ali Wine. Just power. Now let's be frank with each other. Doesn't this simply mean power to the people? But haven't the people often been unjustly disempowered by an array of tyrants, monarchs, and even the occasional science fiction figure? Is this rise to power purely coincidental? Or is it a product of inheritance, education, ambition, or simply good casting? But hold on. There have also been defiant social uprisings, mass demonstrations and revolutions, often considered to justly overthrow leaders and governments. But is the power of the people always more just than that of a ruler? These days, haven't online communities been successful in instigating mass protests, sometimes resulting in far-reaching social and political change? But then again, when 500 million people on Facebook express a common opinion, who is really holding the strings? When on Twitter, one user tweets, let's change something, it's our power to decide. Does the question of what you want to change become irrelevant? If the world is full of varying belief systems and moral codes, who decides what is just or unjust? And hasn't history taught us to never underestimate the power of rhetoric? But don't we all seek power? Don't you seek power too? Isn't it simply human nature? Something you see every day in the business community. Uh, by the way, how is your power legitimised? According to whose values? You know what? After all this, I really don't think there is any such thing as just power. Or is there? Imagine that we, leaders of tomorrow, are invited back to St. Gallen 40 years from now as global figures in government, in business, in philanthropy, and in other fields. The leaders of tomorrow of that time will ask, what have you done to improve our world? And what did you do that your predecessors did not? How will we answer them? Well, I can't say for sure, but I'd like to offer a few thoughts. We have the right, and indeed the obligation, to challenge the leaders of today, to ask them why they didn't do more to address the problems that our generation has been asked to solve. But when we fulfill our responsibility to challenge, we assume two other responsibilities. To propose alternatives to the policies that we question, and to take steps to implement those alternatives when our opportunity arrives. Now, the good news is that for all that is unacceptable in our world, and indeed there is an intolerable amount that is unacceptable in our world, in many ways we live in the best of times. World wars are a remnant of the past. The prospect of nuclear annihilation is increasingly distant. The rate of global poverty continues to fall. And the life expectancy of the average individual continues to rise. But each of these good news stories has a concerning counterpart. Competition over basic resources such as food and energy is intensifying. The nuclear nonproliferation regime is eroding. The basis for an even worse financial crisis is emerging. And climate change is accelerating. And making matters worse, more complicated, is that the good news stories and the bad news stories, they derive from precisely the same flows and networks that bring us together. And in that sense, globalization is a formidable gamble. It promises ever greater opportunities to improve the human condition on the one hand and ever greater risks of disasters that could undercut that progress. And it follows then that ever greater global cooperation is needed 
to increase the opportunities and to decrease the risks. But achieving that cooperation is unlikely unless we agree on a few propositions. First, that as more actors, state and non-state, come to participate in global politics, it will become increasingly difficult for any one of them to dominate. Second, that attempts to achieve such dominance will increasingly undermine global peace and prosperity. And third, that our future is less likely to be determined by the ambitions of individual actors than by the urgency of shared challenges. And these are challenges that lie far beyond the control of any one actor. Now, if we accept these propositions, it behooves us to think creatively and to think boldly about how we can exercise power not over one another, not over one another, but with one another. And accepting these propositions requires us to be brave. It requires us to take a leap of faith and to believe that the greatest hope for our own progress lies in the progress and lies in the empowerment of others. Now, why do we have to take this leap of faith? Because the threats to our world will not wait for us to do otherwise. The threats to our world will not wait for us to settle old scores. The threats to our world will not wait for us to settle old rivalries. And the threats to our world most certainly will not wait for us to establish a hierarchy among countries and among peoples before we get on with the business of cooperation. And if we mistakenly go down that route, I fear that we may actually be overwhelmed by challenges that were actually once within our capacity to solve. And so, all of the above being said, what is our task? What is our challenge as leaders of tomorrow? Our task and our challenge is to prove that a world in which just power prevails is not only necessary, not only necessary, but also more importantly, attainable. It's a daunting task. And it's a task that raises an uncomfortable but unavoidable question. Will we, leaders of tomorrow, rise to the occasion? I don't know if we will. I don't know if we will. But I know that we must. And I know that we can. And therein lies the crucial distinction. I know that we can. For if there's one lesson from our past that applies to an uncertain future, it's this that the brilliance of our minds and the strength of our characters scale with the magnitude of our calling. And I hope that in that simple but powerful lesson from history, we can all find comfort, we can all find hope, and we can all find strength as we go forward. Welcome to St. Gallen. <laughs>